Um, Attorney Gens, would you like to give a comment on today's hearing? Well, I'm pleased with uh, the result. Well, we could the uh, motion for selective prosecution discovery has been largely allowed. Uh, it's been narrowed in a couple of uh, respects, which do, don't really affect what we're trying to do here. Uh, we've made a threshold showing that is very, very strong. We show that the city and the police department are maintaining a list of targeted lists of certain types of protests. Those are protesters against their rule of their policies and against vaccine mandates. So please remember where you are, you have to see it. Good morning, everyone. Will the parties identify themselves to the record? Media Revenue of Commonwealth. Attorney William Gens from the defense. Okay. Yes, sir. There were two motions that we served the last time with the understanding that we would uh, address them today. Okay. Uh, one was the Commonwealth's motion uh, regarding Joiner, and the other was, and this is an opposition that has been filed. And the other was our motion, or at least not our initial motion on selective prosecution discovery. All right. And I had an opportunity to read the supplemental that you also filed. I think it was last week or the week before. I think it was last week sometime. And uh, I was like the 29th of October. Um, and of course, the court, we filed in court the the yes. Yes. Right. So why don't we first address the issue regarding Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the is asking you to join these two cases. Um, we feel that the necessary prerequisites are satisfied here because they are related cases, meaning the majority of the rule. Um, in this instance, they are both pertaining to the same factual universe. Um, the alleged offenses of disturbing the peace are alleged to have occurred um, on the same date, at the same time, um, essentially uh, right next to one another, um, and involving the precise um, modus operandi. Um, just present the same modus operandi um, for both the fact that it's, um, In terms of that prejudice to the defendants, Commonwealth's position is that there wouldn't be any prejudice. Uh, again, it, it's the same universe of facts, and any potential um, issues, I think, can be easily mitigated by proper jury instructions that expect the case to be joined, the jury find all the elements beyond a reasonable doubt for each individual defendant. So based on all that, we would, and for the sake of judicial economy, we would ask you to grant the joint motion. All right, thank you. Attorney James. Your Honor, uh, the defendants are not uh, co-defendants of the understanding of that terminology, um, that not a, a case in a joint venture, alleged to be a case in a joint venture, they may be both present at the same time. Incidentally, there were other individuals who were present as well. Using the Commonwealth's logic of uh, things just being related in terms of time and place, uh, if they were, to say, Ryan at a football stadium, you, you could have one mass trial of everybody that was alleged to be rioting and people on different sides of the stadium. Having said that, there are other problems involved with the joinder of this matter for trial. I don't have a problem joining it for trial proceedings, but uh, <clears throat> there are statements that are attributable, both verbal and nonverbal statements, to uh, Ms. Llewellyn, which creates a proof of fraud. And a jury instruction, as the law makes clear, can cure that type of uh, interpretation by the jury, which is almost inevitable when people are being tried for it, that one statement. So what specifically were the statements? There were statements regarding uh, 
a discussion about ceasing activity and about and responses from Ms. Llewellyn, also the nonverbal alleged um, statements was Ms. Llewellyn banging on a pot, uh, pots and pans, uh, none of which applies to Ms. Vitale, who's just there, standing there, um, which is a very good defense to a certain police job. I'll be feeding the third one is. But um, the jury is invited in a coach defendant situation by, just by the nature of the joiners to achieve the act of one to the other, the statements of one to the other. And that's the problem that we see here. It's a group of issues. Okay. I, I will look at it and I'll um, write a decision. Okay. All right. I'll take it under advisement. You both make good points. Thank you. All right. I'll look at it closely. And would you like to address the other motions? Yes. Why don't we move on to the viewers so, um, to challenge selective prosecution? <coughs> the a selective prosecution challenge uh, is ultimately a very high level. And uh, prosecutor's offices need to uh, be able to exercise discretion is something that we invest them with as a matter of course and a good policy. However, the uh, established law does make uh, does create a mechanism, two prong mechanism to challenge the prosecutorial choices. Uh, in given circumstances. The first part of that challenge is what we're involved with here, and for that, the threshold is actually quite low. The only thing that needs to be shown <coughs> and we cite a lot to this effect, and I'm afraid there's more law out there uh, that I didn't say. Uh, the only thing that we really need to show is some degree of disparate treatment in the same circumstances. Uh, the materials that we get, and, and the second thing I want to say on that is unlike other discrimination, discriminatory type of challenges, we do not have to show that the, the defendants are members of a protected class based on race, etc. The content of speech qualifies political speech, and there's ample precedent on that as well. In this case here, I submit that our show is quite robust. Uh, in fact, it probably exceeds most of the showings on the second farm in some respects. The first thing that we have, courtesy of some FOIA responses, is correspondence, email correspondence, there are two pieces between the police, Boston Police Department, and the uh, mayoral administration. The boss at Exhibit 2 is the, is an email from the Boston Police, sorry, but one of our exhibits is an email from the Boston Police. And you're, and you're I'm, I'm uh, is this the supplemental? Not the supplemental. The very first this first. is the uh, the first. It's, it's actually exhibit four to the first memorandum. Okay. And, uh, the, the pertinent part that I want to focus on is uh, the third paragraph in the bottom last sentence. We have a master list of protests. That's the Boston Police writing to the mayor's office in Exhibit 4. And that's in April of 2022. Say that again, please. That was exhibit four. Right? That's exhibit four. Okay. Then if we skip back to exhibit two, we have in June of 2022, the mayoral administration representative from that uh, 
copying several other uh, representatives of the Memorial Administration, um, but directed to a Boston police captain with a list of persons. That list of persons, has been, which has been aptly described in the media as we have an enemies list, is a list of persons who, by and large, have subsequently been the subject of prosecutions, mostly for disturbing the police or disorderly conduct, depending on how it was uh, charged. Uh, I can tell you that I personally represent or have represented six of the people on this list, and as the body of our memorandum describes, they are prosecutions, including Ms. Patale and Mr. Well, as well as Tony Nelson, Michelle Fenning, are all still members from their inception, and they're all at least, um, that they range from about 10 to 18 months old at this point. Is it for the uh, similar activity that your two clients are alleged to have engaged in? Yes, and, okay. so, and, and, and they were protesting the same subject matter. In each and every case, they were protesting either Mayor Wu or vaccine mandates. Um, there's another person on this list that I represent, Shane Patron, who has just been prosecuted criminally, but she has been subjected to um, all sorts of administrative disciplinary proceedings within the Washington <coughs> Police Department. There are other people who are prosecuted here, but I do not necessarily know the status of their cases uh, or where their cases are. And we, we did a lot of them, or we didn't have time to the one on our own staff. It's tough to say that the, these prosecutions more or less began uh, in the spring of 2022 and really got uh, underway after the June 2022 memorandum. Now, before I get into the selective prosecution uh, data, I have to, I, I want to share with you what bookends this. Because the, it's one thing to have enemies list, but the, the, the motivation in the intent of the attorney's office is made quite clear in a February 2022 uh, joint statement that was published on Congresswoman Diana Presley's website, which, which co sponsors right in the materials that we took right off the website by the Suffolk County District Attorney Pat Hayes. And um, what is, it, what is, is that an exhibit? It's an exhibit. It's the last exhibit in the first memorandum. It's uh, exhibit 12, but it's at the very end. And I'm going to read just a few excerpts from the last page. Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know that this is necessarily relevant to the specific discussion. I think that some of these we have no objection to. Um, others, I think, are, object are objectionable for simple reasons such as the request information doesn't exist or we don't know where. I think we're talking about two different things. You're, you're, you're arguing the selected process independent of the discovery request. Yeah? It's really related to the discovery request. It's a stern request by selective prosecution discovery, which is the first phase in a selective prosecution. You don't necessarily, on the first, in the first part, have to show intent and motive, but the point is, even at this stage, I can't. Okay, so. I think that we could perhaps be more efficient. Yes. Just by going through item by item, some of these. Have the two of you had an opportunity to sit down and actually go through everything no. item by item? We have. I've got no feedback from the prosecution on this. I will say, disclose to the court that in two other cases on that enemies list, the courts in the BMC have already played this one. Okay. But I have not, not received any discovery yet. But, but you know I'm going to make an independent decision. I expect that you will. 
And that's why I'm taking great pains to try to make, clarify my position as much as I possibly can. Uh, if I may just for a moment, yeah, go focus ahead. on the intent issue, because it's, a, it's an element that uh, should be considered. Uh, the statement says, make no mistake, the relentless and hateful attacks on Mayor Wu have no place in our society and are far cry from the political debate and the peaceful dissent that is welcome and necessary in a healthy democracy. And the nation would explore what they consider to be uh, peaceful dissent and how they're getting back. Uh, it is due to her brave, steadfast leadership, her commitment to science and the public health, and the public health, life saving vaccines. Would you like some more? Just to have a look at some. That the city of Boston is making necessary flowers. We stand in solidarity with her and call for an immediate end to this dangerous and hateful behavior. This is people holding signs, chanting slogans, maybe hate of the on a pot of These are not people who are spray painting buildings, assaulting police officers. The heart soul of America deals with that. We went back to the Boston Police Department uh, website, which is appears as exhibit uh, <coughs> It's, it's an exhibit in our uh, materials that lists the arrests that the Boston police effectuated. Okay. In, in the interest of time, it doesn't sound like the two of you have a conference. No. Or you have attempted to determine what the Commonwealth is willing to provide. So I think it would behoove all of us in the interest of time and efficiency if the two of you um, conference, which is the purpose of a free trial hearing, and identify what the Commonwealth has no objection in providing. And then the disputed um, issues then we can address. So, not to cut you off, but let me hear from the Commonwealth in terms of what they're willing to give you, and then what they're not willing to give you, and then we can hone in on that. Because you may be talking about things that they're, that they're um, minimal to. Well, let's see what their objections are. All right, fair enough. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so, 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 just so we're all looking at the same document, what yeah. document are we referencing? So I have defendant's motion for discovery requests regarding selective prosecution. And I understand that um, both defendants have filed this motion and that the motion is substantively identical. Okay. All right. So with respect to item number one, the master list of protesters referenced in Boston Police email of April 4th, 2022. What page are we on? Uh, I'm on page one of the motion. Seven, one of seven, defendant's motion for discovery. I have defendant's motion for discovery requests regarding selective prosecution. Okay, fine. All right, I'm with you. Thank you. Uh, I have one nationalist protesters. Attorney James, you with us too? We're all together? Yes, uh, we're at number one on that two page. Okay. Discovery. All right, go ahead. Uh, no objection to that. Okay. Um, I agree with you. Then um, for item two, for each of the persons on the list, um, all evidence regarding prosecution by the Suffolk County District Attorney, including charges, docket number, police reports, case status, and disposition. So we would object to that on the basis that that would all be available to defense as on mass courts. Um, and then the police reports you would be able to obtain from the clerk's office. 
I, if I may just respond, Your Honor. Yes, The right. problem with that is, is that the names that appear on the so-called enemies list are names, this is nicknames and pseudonyms. I'll, I'll, I'll give them some examples. This is, this is going back to exhibit two in the uh, memorandum. This is, this is a problem. So let, let, let me ask you this. If they're nicknames and pseudonyms, then how is the Commonwealth supposed to accurately identify who's on the list? Well, their agents have it as part of their materials and the list that they're creating. And so that presumably they know what it refers to. I've got here the Mendoza brothers. I don't know how many Mendoza brothers there are, which ones they're referring to, what not to her. Uh, a woman with the last name of Thoy, uh, which, by the way, Shannon uh, Llewellyn is listed here as Shannon K. Uh, is uh, Karina Lucy, which is not her real name, I happen to know that. The others are opaque to me to some degree. So I think that the Commonwealth needs to, at the very least, uh, establish who they actually have on this list. But obviously, it was part of police procedure for their agents. And um, I can, of course, run those things down. That's how we got all the information we have gathered thus far as our passports, once we know the particular incident or arrest. But I think you've established that the list is not an accurate document in terms of individuals. And now you're asking the Commonwealth to establish its <coughs> validity. Uh, well, I don't, I, I'm, my list, I'm, I'm not actually working off of that list. The one I have is that one that's the master list, which I haven't seen. But if the master list has anything like this on it, it's not necessarily going to enable me to do a passport search. Um, what's the position of the Commonwealth? So, I, I think it depends on the basis for which the defendants are seeking the information. So, I, I disagree that the threshold showing relevancy has been made for a selective prosecution fund. If, in seeking this master list, they're seeking evidence of specific bias or um, prejudice against these particular defendants that might be presented as impeachment evidence or um, evidence to right, impugn the credibility of the Commonwealth's evidence trial, I think that falls more comfortably under 14A1A. So if, if that's the purpose for which they're seeking the information, I am I think more amenable to trying to work towards some way of obtaining some of the information, but certainly the ability to do that is limited when we just have references to a master list and we have uh, apparently a, a version of that that includes pseudonyms. I also am struggling to see Particularly, how having all of that information would necessarily show a bias against these specific defendants. It seems to me that if the theory is these specific people were targeted because of political ideology with which Boston Police or my office or the Blue Administration disagrees, then the mere fact that their names are on this quote unquote master list, I think, is really evident in and of itself and it's sufficient to make that point. Supplementing it with additional information about the other people on the list, their case dispositions, all that, I don't know that really adds much by way of probative value. Okay. If I may respond to her. Well, let, let's go on to the third one. You may respond and then let's go on to the third one. Okay, uh, I'll respond quite briefly. I think that the, the district attorney misunderstands the intent or the purpose of this discovery. I, and I'm going to quote the Supreme Court of the United States in the United States versus Armstrong here, uh, 517 U.S. 456, 1996 case. A selective prosecution claim is not a defense on the merits of the criminal charge itself, but an independent assertion that the prosecutor got the reasons forbidden by the Constitution. 
What we're attempting to show is two things at the same time. One is, here we have a class of people who are engaged in a specific content protest. Here's how they have been treated. Here are people engaged in protest with a, a politically favored content, and here is how they have been treated. In order for me to flesh out that list of people who are protesting disfavored content, I need to know who they are and how they're being handled. Uh, and I have a stumbling block here because I don't have a master list to see what's on it, but the list I do have appears to be the supplement of the out of that master list has names that can't be searched. So it may think it's an obstacle to attempting to engage in this investigation. Uh, so I think it's, it's highest relevant to a selective prosecution. I agree with my brother that it's not necessarily relevant to trial issues or impeachment. Okay. It, I could just clarify. It, I, I don't think that I agree with Gun's Council's position as to the appropriate legal standard. We're dealing not with uh, federal legal protection case law here, but we're in the realm of articles 1 and 10, Commonwealth of Laura, Commonwealth of Long, Commonwealth being part of LB. Those are the controlling cases here. Um, and there, there has to be a threshold showing of relevance um, in order to obtain this type of discovery. And it has to be relevant towards the standard that's articulated in Commonwealth v. Laura, which is first, that there's a broader class of people than those actually charged, committed the offense. Uh, second, that the disparate treatment was consistent or deliberate. And third, that there's a reasonable inference that the cause or factor was some type of impermissible classification. I'm not understanding the defense counsel's position as to who the broader class of people is who were treated differently. Um, Commonwealth v. Long, I think, is a very instructive case at this point because it really hones in on the importance of comparing how this happens with selective prosecuting laws, um, especially okay. in discovery. So, so, why don't we do this? Let's, that particular item is hotly contested. I'll give both of you an opportunity to submit uh, a written mem memo specifically on that issue. <coughs> and let's, let's move on. Yeah, I Okay. So number two, the two of you will submit a written. And incidentally, just to make things easy, Ron, I'm willing to waive number four. I think it's duplicative of number two. Okay. So let's talk about three. Um, four. Number three, um, that's all the communications apart from emails referenced. Um, Two are from Boston Police, the Southern NDA's office, and any member of the Andrews administration regarding the treatment of arrest process and the arresters. So, a couple of stuff going on with this. Uh, I think one, I, I don't know that this necessarily exists. Two, if it does, I'm not quite sure how we would go about identifying those emails. It seems Rather broad. And that's the, the third part. It, it seems overly broad under the burden stuff. But I also think it uh, you're just too close to the protected category of work product relative to legal decisions about charges and strategy. Attorney Jens, it seems rather broad. Do so you want to handle it? So, yeah, I think that we can. Oh, need to pull away now, sir. Sir, put your phone away. I'm doing that. I recognize that the potential is there, given the way it's currently worded, to encroach on work product uh, and type of programs. And I certainly wouldn't be, uh, I would certainly rely upon the Commonwealth's representation of something not being produced because it's actually work product. However, to the extent that it articulates a policy uh, type of uh, position, <coughs> either to or from, 
the, those entities, the Suffolk County DA's office, the Boston Police, uh, and, and, and the Mayor's office. I think that it's highly relevant. This is especially the case where in one of the cases that we've attached as Exhibit A to our memo involving Sean Nelson, Sean Nelson is <coughs> subject to a seizure and an arrest at the direction of Brianna Miller, who is one of the lieutenants in the Mayor Wood administration, who is directing police officers to effectuate this. We have, and then it's the DA's office, Relentlessly crossed. Yes, and on um, other objection number three, I find is overly broad. If you want to resubmit something <coughs> that's much more targeted, I'm always happy to consider number three is okay. Well, since we're going to brief number two anyway, I can uh, tailor that and give you my right. reasons. That's fine. As part of that I mean, uh, presentation. But right now, the reasons too broad. Okay, that's four. You have waived. Let's go on to five. Identification of any operational unit of the Boston Police task the police and protest activity and the policies followed in determining which particular person would be prosecuted. To the best of my knowledge, there is no such unit. I'm happy to ask. Okay. Um, and that any policies or procedures would be available publicly online on BPD's website. All right. So by agreement, number five. Number six. The statement of the practices followed in implementing each policy articulated in response to the form five. This, this seems to be the same as what to me. Agreed. Attorney Jennings, do you agree with that? Uh, I think that it's the same. I don't know if Commonwealth really wants to uh, produce that if it exists, but, uh, but I like it. Right. But you, you agree it's the same? More that before. five and six are are talking about the same subject matter. Well, five identifies any particular units of the Boston Police. Six identifies as for a statement of practices followed. They're basically a policy one. So that's a lot but easier to answer so five yeah, and, and six. Yeah, in five you're also saying and the policies follow. Oh, the po Policy follow might not necessarily be the same as the follow policy that's written. Okay. So if, if there if there are any written guidelines or no statements, my, my understanding is that those are made available on the EPD's website publicly. Um, okay, let's go on to seven. Um, so seven is an explanation of how the decisions to investigate and prosecute in the present case were made and how they were compliant with policies and practices which you get a response request support number six. So I'll kind of break that up into pieces. An explanation of how the decisions to investigate and prosecute in the present case were made. Um, that I feel is not a proper subject for discovery. I, I think that's certainly an argument and an issue and something that the Commonwealth can be pressed on at trial. Um, but it isn't really a subject that you would produce in response to the discovery request. Um, so I, I don't think that's a proper request in the discovery process. And my concern would be who would answer the question? Um, whoever is An in charge of that, of any such policy. Now, if there is no such policy, that's useful to me too. And then the case law is that out. I took these discovery requests, essentially gleaning them from the case law. And if, the, if there's no policy regarding uh, how to handle particular case speech, then it can't give rise to a uh, conclusion, a, a judicial conclusion, because this is most certainly not a trial, that the policy is arbitrary and capricious, or that it is slanted and discriminatory one way or the other, or any other number of possibilities. So um, if, if the answer to that is it doesn't exist, I'm content with that answer. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think that's an argument the Commonwealth needs to make either orally or in writing in response to some type of motion to dismiss or other argue, legal argument by the best house. I, I think it's a it's asking for a legal position, not uh, furnishing factual information. 
Is it fair to say, Attorney Jens, that the court can expect a motion to dismiss filed on behalf of your two clients arguing selective prosecution and the violation of their constitution? Exactly right. Okay. And that's, that's the next phase right. that I'm building towards. Right, right. I get that. So I would suggest that number seven is an argument that you present in that motion. I do not see that as something that the Commonwealth needs to answer at this point. And I'll know your objection. Okay, then. Okay. So the last request. <coughs> Any standards, policies, practices, or criteria employed by the district attorney's office to guard against the influence of political, other arbitrary, or invidious factors in the selection of individual defendants for prosecution. So I think it's a now we don't have any type of written policies. I mean, these are these are obligations that we all have as a as attorneys, just under the rules of professional ethics, under the Constitution, and you know, we as employees are and are, are in members of the bar so to follow them. So it's just you know, an expectation that we will abide by our standard ethical and legal obligations. There are no written policies or procedures like this. Okay. There's nothing independent of. Um, what is required under the case law and under the rules of professional responsibility. Is that your answer? Yeah, that is my answer. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I disagree. Um, the, the, what, what my brother has just said, respectfully, is essentially the mantra of prosecutorial discretion. And what we presented here thus far, I haven't talked about it yet, is a compendium how violent, felonious persons protesting on Boston Common tore Boston Common at downtown crossing a park. And out of 52 prosecutions, why six of them were dismissed outright? Only two convictions, conviction rate less than 4%. That is not coincidence. And the court, I think, after surveying all of our materials that we have already and will come in, will will perceive that it's not coincidence that every climate change protester, every transgender protester, every so-called race-based protester, or at the least under this administration, two convictions, by the way, were accomplished under the predecessor administration. They're all dismissed. Well, all well, dismissed. Our, yeah. And well, then people who are non-violent no, no, no. They're dismissed by in looking at the materials you submitted. Many of them are dismissed upon the completion of community service as well, correct? Uh, some of them. Some of them. Final ones, the state hours, 28 hours of community service. 38 felonies, 35 felonies amongst this here. No, no, just answer my question. Just yeah. answer my question. It's your materials that you submitted, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Okay? The dismissed, but upon the completion of 28 hours of community service, yes? Yes, uh, and, and like yeah. an act. I liken that to the fellow that pulled the fire alarm at the <coughs> in the U.S. Congress to stop a vote gets a thousand dollar fine while other people go to prison for years. Right. This is a problem, not just here. No, I understand. I understand. So, um, so number nine, uh, the Commonwealth has answered the accordingly in their motion. So I think going forward then, um, I would ask that you uh, submit any materials or arguments that you want me to consider regarding request number two. And number three, you wanted to look at again, Attorney Jones? Yeah, I will. I'll uh, refine my position as best I can because I do realize there are some considerations, valid considerations. Okay. Uh, in this, and I'll support it as best I can. Excellent. And then I'll also look at the request for joining, and I'll make a decision on that. Is there anything else that either either one of you would like to discuss at this point? Not at this time, Your Honor. Just except, except for the next day. Just regarding um, the defense counsel could 
provide, if possible, um, if not, I understand, but if possible, some type of time frame, maybe that, that would be a bit easier on the Commonwealth in terms of ascertaining whether the requested discovery exists. We shall do that. I mean, I'm trying to focus on this particular administration, even though it appears to me that the policies that we pursue are legacy policies, the one that preceded it. I, I will narrow it as best I can. Okay. Thank you all for your patience and your courtesy. What is a good day for everyone to reconvene? You want to give them 30 day day? Would you prefer to be within 30 or would you prefer to go beyond this? No, 30 days. You want to within 30? Okay. How is. Um, I have December 18th. I have uh, the week after Christmas. Anyway, whichever is day is most convenient for the part of the house. I certainly would rather do it sooner rather than later. Okay, so I can we plan on early December. I can do either. <laughs> no, I can't do either. I can do December 8th. Fine. What day do we That's a Friday. Friday. That's my Friday. Perfect. Friday. Perfect. December 8th, please. Thank you. All right. All parties present. Their decision. The matter is continued for further status for December 8, 2023. Commonwealth's motion for joint or state and under advisement. Well, we'll December 8th for pre And okay. your honor, in terms of submitting um, briefs on the matter, when would you like to file? At your convenience. Okay. But then, Attorney Dennis, you know, at your convenience. In yeah. terms of the written materials. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the docket entry, it's, will it read uh, the, the, the discovery motion is allowed by agreement to the extent? Uh, I mean, by agreement in part, denied in part, and items two and three to provide written memos. Thank you so much. All right. December 8th for pre Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Attorney Gens, would you like to give a comment on today's hearing? Well, I'm pleased with uh, the result. Well, we could the uh, allowed, motion please. for selective prosecution discovery has been largely allowed. Uh, it's been narrowed in a couple of uh, respects, which do, don't really affect what we're trying to do here. Uh, we've made a threshold showing that is very, very strong. We've shown that the city and the police department are maintaining a list of targeted lists of certain types of protests. Those are protesters against their rule of their policies and against vaccine mandates. Other protesters we've been able to show thus far, those who are protesting against you know, perceived uh, racism and against so-called climate change, and who are protesting transgender issues or who are themselves transgender. Uh, the city appears to be, bat uh, the DA's office appears to be batting a thousand in terms of dismissing their cases and dismissing them promptly while they persist in prosecutions, full, full throttle prosecutions against individuals who are engaged in non-violent protests, charged with things like disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace and the like. Uh, we've shown this overwhelmingly with regard to the George Floyd protesters, where out of 52 arrests and 35 of those being felonious charges, 46 of them were dismissed or not crossed. Only two convictions, which appear to be opportunistic looters, not protesters. Uh, every single climate change protest that we've surveyed has been dismissed. Every transgender protester has been dismissed. This isn't coincidence. This, the, anyone viewing this material would be well warranted in concluding that it's by design. Uh, as, and uh, that it, it's no secret that this district attorney has made his uh, partisan leanings quite clear in public statements 
I'll read it, read to you one of them that's read out to the law, which was on the website of uh, an anniversary. I'm sponsored by amongst others, attorney Kevin Hayden, as well as a, a long list of other so-called uh, political leaders. Uh, and it basically says, make no mistake, the relentless and hateful attacks on Mayor Michelle Wu have no place in our society and are a far cry from the political debate and peaceful dissent that is welcomed and necessary in a healthy democracy. What's that peaceful dissent according to them? Look at the people that tore up downtown Boston and the downtown crossing after in the George Floyd riots. Look at the people who are protesting climate change by exposing their rear ends at the state house mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of months ago in June. Look at the transgender protesters who attacked people who were themselves protesting a drag queen story hour on video, on film, no doubt about it. They are attacking them, they're not prosecuted. And one of the people they attacked gets prosecuted defending himself. He got a not guilty out of this very far. Further statements within that statement regarding Mayor Wu, it's due to her grave and steadfast leadership, her commitment to science and the public health, including her common sense and life-saving vaccine mandates. The city of Boston is making no necessary progress. We stand in solidarity with her and call for an immediate end to this dangerous and hateful behavior. The, this district attorney has taken a public position that characterizes legitimate peaceful protest as being hateful and intolerable in our society, while at the same time excusing felonious conduct on behalf of other protesters who are <coughs> promoting <coughs> agendas that he agrees with. It's divisive. It chills the First Amendment, and it contributes to what social scientists call delegitimization, which is the lack of confidence of the public in their institutions, including the judiciary. Right. Our case is about addressing that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, no, it's no longer about right. the protest itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was great.